All right, good morning, everybody. Um, as Asanka said, I am the Director of Enterprise Architecture at Cerner, and I am going to talk about will your agile practices be the death of architecture? Just as a sneak peek, because I run Enterprise Architecture, the answer is no, but I will help you understand why I think that. So first of all, about Cerner. Cerner is based out of the United States in Kansas City, Missouri. We are an international company. We work in healthcare IT, so, and we primarily operate in a B2B manner, so a lot of you may not have heard of us. We do have over 28,000 associates. Uh, we put a lot of effort into our R&D, so you can see our investment there. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about my team just to help you understand how we're organized. So within Cerner, my team covers these functional areas, which I've been told is slightly unusual. Uh, one of my areas, we have emergency, emerging practices, and that's where we do AI research, our cloud readiness deployment. We also support information management, so all our data security, data architecture, data privacy. I have a group that does business process design, as well as associate engagement or employee engagement. And then, of course, we have information technology architecture, which tends to be your traditional architecture. And then we have a specific area involved with strategic program development. So those are things looking at just disruptive areas. How should we be organizing? What should we be doing around that space? So first, I wanted to start with Agile. So as you already heard today, and I'm sure you're aware of every day, yes, it's popular. So I pulled a couple uh, quotes, one from Gartner um, in one of their architecture documents, that at least half will use a framework for scaling agile development. And I love this one, and you'll see why in the next slide. Um, the United States Defense Innovation Board put out a paper, and within it, agile is a buzzword of software development. So most all development projects are mostly by default now declared to be agile. So what does that mean? They actually published an agile BS guidance paper in the last month, and I love it. Um, for any of you that have worked with development teams, anytime you try to enforce standards or governance or any type of practice, one of the first pushbacks you'll get from the developers are, well, we're agile, right? We iterate, we grow. And so they have these great kind of Q&As for you to think about on whether your teams are actually doing agile. Um, it's a great kind of litmus test, and I love that they felt like, you know what, we're going to publish this to our stakeholders, we're going to help hold people accountable, so it's a good read. One of my favorites are the first one. So you're not really agile if no one on the team is talking with the users of the program and no, you know, the boss or the, the loudest voice in the room is not necessarily your user. So I do have on my architecture team, I have both, um, I have the DevOps with CICD, and what we do is we establish the practices, the frameworks, the pipeline. And then I also have a lot of strategic architects. And what I noticed was there was this disconnect or maybe clash of cultures between the two. And so what I did is, being a researcher, I went to study why. So I'm going to show you some things that I noticed in patterns around the differences between them, first starting with your definition. So if you go to look up what is Agile, you can go out to the Agile Manifesto website where these values are posted. And it's really interesting to see the words that they pick out. I think words are very important, right? Collaboration, response, interactions. And you can see they, they definitely call out working software over comprehensive documentation. All right, then you go to say, well, what is architecture? What is software architecture? Where can you go to find that? There's a standards organization that will help you define that. And if you look just the terminology that they use, the way they define architecture, again, very different. So it's fundamental, it's a system, it's embodied in its relationships, and it has principles and design. So you can see the difference between these two kinds of concepts. 
One of my favorite things is also, even in the definition, they have a roadmap. So any of you fellow architects out there, um, you can appreciate the fact that not only is it a standard with you know, numbers, but it also has its own road roadmap to when they update it. But fear not. So all of you architects worried about this agile you know, emphasis, ISO is starting to define Agile as well. And the funniest thing is, when I found this and where Agile is within the, the standards, it's in the user documentation section. So there's a nice kind of insight on where they think it might be able to help. So the next area that I started were frameworks. And again, if you look at how the frameworks are delivered, right? So if you look at, this is, um, they have the different pipelines, it's curved, they don't all, you know, they're not perfectly linear. This I pulled from the Agile Alliance site. And it's great, it's all hyperlinked, you know, you can go and explore and find the different areas. And this is the architect's world. So if you look at it, it's very boxy, right? There's a lot of components. It's very well documented. And man, we got lines going everywhere. So if you go back and forth, again, think of the people who are indoctrinated into these two different areas and why they might have troubles communicating. And then the people. So within our agile practices, um, we're constantly doing training. We speak to you know, the, the different groups on what role do you, do you play in this project. A lot of times uh, we talk about hats. What hat are you wearing? Are you working on a design? Are you working on delivery? Are you working on automated testing? Where do you fit in? And it's always about the hats. We literally have pictures of roles and responsibilities with hats because it's around the idea that your hat will change depending on what the needs of the project is. And then this, this is the architect. For those of you who haven't seen this, this is from The Matrix. And The Matrix, um, there's a guy, Neo, that goes through, you know, realizes that you know, the world is false and it's all built on code. And he goes through all these struggles to find the end answer, and the end answer is the architect, right? And the architect has total control except for a few anomalies, and what he expects this you know, Neo to do is concede, follow the system, give up, and continue to work. Again, hats, architect. And then if you look at team design, so um, there's the attribution to our friend Jeff at Amazon about if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, it's too big, right? And then on the other side with architects, um, our developers have given it a four-letter word. So big design up front. Um, that's what uh, we constantly get told as we start to design or plan at the beginning. You're doing a four-letter word. Stop it. Well, guess what? There's reasons why we do those four-letter words, and it's called planning. So, looking at it, the two perspectives do seem to be at complete odds. And it's not just us, they're not just the architects within the software world. There's a um, current architect that I've been studying, he's a Japanese architect, um, Tado Ando, and uh, he has some really interesting perspectives on what is good architecture, how you contribute to your environment. And one of his uh, quotes that he has is, the speed of change makes you wonder what will become of architecture. So I like this because it relates not only in, well, it doesn't apply in software anymore, but also he's building these beautiful buildings. Um, he has a unique take on how to use concrete, but uh, use light to create these beautiful structures. This is one um, that I really liked. He was given the objective to make this Buddha statue more part of the environment. So this was his starting point. If you notice how bland and bleak and barren it is. And at times I know when you guys are working on your, your systems, trust me, sometimes they feel like this. What he did though, out of everything he could do is he actually buried it. So his interpretation and his approach to making it part of the environment and um, natural was he built this hill of lavender on top of it and created this beautiful environment where using concrete again and light on how um, to make it uh, more seamless and useful. 
like to think that we can do that with our systems too. So back to architecture, are we at the death of it, right? Even people who are making these beautiful buildings, um, they're starting to question, what do we do? Change is coming at us so fast. How do we possibly get our arms around it? But before you decide, so here's the real world. So for those of you who have started on your services journey, you're looking at microservices, you start to do all this research, and you hear, wow, this is great. I call this architecture. So vendors will tell you, as you look into your different applications, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find the repeatable patterns. You're going to pull them out. You're going to create microservices. They're going to be published. The world is great, right? It's a marketplace. In reality, your applications aren't built like that. So for anybody who's uh, been looking at this, so in reality, so take application one. Say it's your HR data, right? You have some systems that have a lot of it, some systems that have a little bit of it. You have some systems that have built multiple feeds. And then, of course, you have a whole lot of spreadsheets, right? Back to that human factor in some of your systems, you know, your, your data loads, your manual data loads. And then, Instead of that so-called secret sauce that you can pull out in your services, what you'll find is there's a whole bunch of, man, I'm brilliant coding that was done eight, 10 years ago, and nobody knows what it does anymore. But if you change one line, all of a sudden systems shut down. How do you make that work? So this is what we're actually dealing with. We want to be like this if we were to go off and start building, and we find out we're like this. So a goal of architecture would be to understand that. How do you help people get from the second picture back to the first picture? One of the things, again, that I like to do is relate software architecture to real-world architecture. I always call this the dinner table talk. So when I'm trying to explain to people what I do, and then how we do different types of architecture, I often use this slide. So when you're building your systems, you usually have different scope. One, you have an intra-system scope. And an intra-system scope is the architecture of that system will contain within it. It's just like if you were to go build a house, you would hope that you would have a blueprint of that house. Or who knows, maybe you won't have a kitchen, or you'll end up with a bathroom with no door, right? Just basics in life. The next level of scope, we go to the inter-system scope. And this is really about taking a business process, which is why I have process in my group, taking a process and mapping it from data origin all the way through to where decisions are made. It may be one system, it may be five systems, but it's really making sure that we have connectivity, the data is getting there in the right amount of time, that we trust the information flowing. You do this today in your development communities and your business communities that you expect when you go in, you know, I want to build a gas station in the middle of this neighborhood. Do we do that? I don't know. So what we do is we have plans around, you know, different development groups to say, here's how things relate, here's what fits, here's what doesn't. And then we get into domain scope. This is primarily where my team operates, which is really like city planners, is what I call us. So our job is to look ahead. It's to say, all right, we see all this development going on. Does it make sense? Is this a place where we'd like to build? What are the standards? What are the safety issues? All of those types of things. And we have a variety of tools to do that. So generally, as we're working on our architectures, there are different types, different areas, and we work in different spots. And at no point did I say, I have a crystal ball and I know everything within the architects, um, nor do you think, or should you think that your developers also have said crystal ball, because again, if we're starting to plan, we're starting to design, if we use the crystal ball method, we may end up with three bedrooms, no living room. So the objectives are still valid of architecture, but how do we start to reconcile them? So we found that we had to change some of our expe expectations around what architecture would be. So we'll go through five changes that we've made and ones that you should consider making as well in order to make these two different areas coexist. 
First, and it goes from both areas, you have to realize one size does not fit all. So as you're trying to modernize, as you're trying to create standards, governance, you have to understand that no one size will fit all, but you can still categorize the different changes in your systems. You must allow for large, complex systems as well as small, well-contained services. We have a spectrum of things that we're developing, and so we have to make sure that we're talking to those audiences and those development groups. For instance, my financial system is a very large, complex system, right? It does ledgers. We don't want people to go to jail because it's not right, right? We like people to get paid, all of those kinds of things. And we also have very adaptive, well-contained services that, are, that we iterate on very quickly because they have different use cases. You have to think about the architecture role. Don't focus on the title. So what that means is you have to shift from the idea that this architect is the anointed one or makes all the decisions. And you really have to start talking about architecture as a practice filled by many different people. It actually becomes more like a hat. And with that, you have to give them the training, the governance, the make them enablers of it. So that means no more architect, right? The architect. It also means some of the crystal balls, um, we have to acknowledge they don't exist. Community. Another thing that we've put a lot of investment in is designing our community. So we went, we shifted from a governance war, uh, role, we used to have an architecture review board, right? That was a very heavy term. We're now creating a community and we talk more about our brain trust. How are we developing our resources across all of development? How are we, we invite our operations system engineers. Everybody gets to participate in this community. It's not somebody that you know, has a certain amount of training, a certain number of years of experience. This is from, we still do design reviews. This is from one of our, um, when we published about it, what we said the goal was. And really, I'm trying to echo here, if you think back to Agile, echo a lot of the Agile principles in our architecture. And with this, this is literally, it's on my blog. I do it in my internal presentations. I just acknowledge as I'm talking to our developers or other stakeholders, yeah, you got to do this. It's still important. We're still going to invest in it, and here's why. So we speak to language that's very, you know, uh, conversational as well. All right, so my next thing. Um, I am an architect at heart. I love to draw. That's how I think. That's how I communicate. Um, there are lots of ways to draw, though. You can't be so stubborn in that only a good solution will have five different architecture diagrams. Um, and the level of details that you have people put into your diagrams, pictures, documents, whatever you want to call them, will vary. You have to make sure that the diagram that you're building fits the need or the project that you're working on. This is one that I drew around our enterprise data platform. And you'll see we have cloud, we have on-prem. It talks about our API work, our BI, and so on. But you'll notice this is literally one of my diagrams. There's no technology. When I first showed this to my executive stakeholders, they were like, wait. Where's our partner names? Where's our technologies? It's like, no, this is a reference architecture. We're going to take a step back. We're going to start talking about functional requirements because we know our technology is going to change. The decision, we can't make a decision now that we expect to live for three years. What we need to do is make sure we're covering these functional requirements and supporting them that way. Of course, now mind you, the next slide in the deck it floats in the technology vendors. So we didn't completely divorce forever, but these are the types of pictures that we're now using. Oops. So agile architecture. Just like we're doing agile practices in development, operations, security, we also have to start thinking about and researching it from an architecture perspective. There's lots of different trains on thought on how to do this. Um, we still go back and forth on which one we're going to do, just like I'm sure anybody doing agile development does as well. What we try to impact to the community and to the people that traditionally lead our projects, so we still learn 
architecture you still have to learn. Um, I have this um, picture on the board in my office that says, OK, just like we learn when we deliver, we learn when we discover, and we have to make it a continuous cycle. You'll notice there is no disconnect. We work together, we collaborate, we partner, and we iterate through it. The practices we've been telling our development teams, our other teams to do, we will do as an architecture practice as well. All right, so recap. The five changes we applied when architecting. And you notice at this point, I chose architecting on purpose rather than this big, heavy architecture thing. It goes back into now we're in a practice. We're starting to think about how we design and put things together. Um, and the five things, right? One size does not fit all. We're shifting from a, t a particular title or anointed one mentality into a role. We really focus a lot on our community. We hold um, meetups. We do, uh, we call them nudges, tech nudges, like little blips out to our development community. So we try to make it more engaging. There are many types of diagrams, right? Pick the one that works best, not the one that you think is the absolute only way to communicate forever. And allow flexibility when architecting, right? You iterate, you take feedback, you work with the different groups. So I'm going to bring it back to um, the Japanese architect that I have been studying. Um, I really think his perspective that he looks out for in the, the buildings that he designs, again, really resonates in the software that we design as well. So it is the age of discovery, and it has brought a disruption to our environment. And so architects are facing the age of responsibility. When you design and build something, you have to consider what you were taking away from the earth or your environment in order to make something new. So I really like that, and it's a good thing to keep in mind as we tell people when you're building these systems, when you're building these services, you have to make sure you're thinking of, thinking of them as a piece of a whole, how you contribute back, the things that you're doing. And so, again, right, this is his architecture diagram. I love this. So this is a picture that he drew for one of his buildings. Um, it's the Poly Grand Theater. And you'll notice, right, look at the, the color, the lights. Um, you have to allow your developers this architecture role in order to figure out how to create buildings, amazing buildings like this, which I think is our goal. Okay, and with that, I'm a little ahead of time, but I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Asanka.